right, let's start with problem two. This is about price discrimination. We saw it right before the break. I knew a lot of you would forget. I tried to remind you to study it. I, well, at least some of you didn't. So in a two-part tariff, the firm is going to set the price to maximize total surplus. So if we, if in this case, what we need to do is draw, draw marginal cost curve or demand curve, and wherever they, they intersect, that's going to be our, um, our optimal price. So in this case, intersection is going to happen at 10, which means that the variable cost is going to be 10, and each consumer is going to buy 10 units. In order to find the entry fee, we need to find the area uh, between the demand and the price, which would be the surplus. That area in this case is going to be equal to, what is it, 5 times 10 divided by 2, which is going to be equal to 25. So it's going to be the two-part tariff. It's going to be an entry fee of 25 plus $10 per unit. And that was the answer to part A. Part B was free if you understand that this is a two-part tariff problem because the price is set to maximize surplus, which means that the de dead weight loss is equal to zero. For part C, we need to write the profits of the firm, which are going to depend on the revenue from each consumer, which is going to be given by price uh, times the quantity of the consumer plus the entry fee. So we multiply by, by the number of consumers. That's going to be the total revenue. And then we need to subtract the total cost, which depends on the total quantity sold, which is n times the quantity bought by each consumer. By the way, the price doesn't depend on the consumer. It's the same price for all. So we can just write P instead of PI. Uh, given what we did before, the price is 10, the entry fee is 25, and the cost is going to be uh, 2,500 minus 10 times the quantity, which is 10 times n. Uh, it's it's not 25,000, it's just 2,500, so I need to erase, erase one zero. Uh, so this is equal to uh, 25n minus 2,500, and it's going to be equal to zero when n is equal to 100. All right. Now the solution to part three is that a bid is going to be weakly dominated if and only if it's either uh, less than the reserve price, which in this case is equal to 20, or uh, greater than the valuation, which in this case was equal to 50. So I'll remind you that this was a first price auction, not a second price auction, and there was a reserve price. So let's think of the justification. Well, if you bid either less than the reserve price or you never win, if, if you bid greater than your value, then you always get, if you win a negative utility, so either of those things guarantees a non-negative, a non-positive utility. In contrast, if you bid, for example, 30, then your utility is never going to be negative and it's going to be positive when you win. So either bidding less than the reserve price or more than your value, it's going to be weakly dominated. For problem four, I copied a table so that we can do things on the table. So we're going to do iterated dominance. So the first thing to do is to mark best responses to A, to B, to C, to D, and to E. And then uh, also for the column player, we need to mark the best responses to B, to W, to X, to Y, and to C. Then we see that um, B is the best response to something. Uh, so is X, so is Y, so is Z, so they cannot be dominated. For W, we need to be careful. We need to check uh, with each action, so we see that that W is not dominated by B, it's not dominated by X, Y, or C, it's not dominated. So now we check layer two, A, B, D are all best responses. How about C and D? Let's start checking E first. Uh, we see that we compare E with each of the other actions and we see that it is not dominated by anything. However, if we compare C to A, we see that every payoff from A is greater than the corresponding payoff for C, and therefore C is dominated by A. We can thus proceed to the following round of elimination. Uh, once we have eliminated A, we can see that B still has respond to, to something. Let's switch to blue. Um, X is still has response to D, Y the same. Now C is not has response to anything and it's actually dominated uh, by, by B. 
In contrast, W is still, if we compare it to any other action, you will see that it's still not dominated, so it's also going to survive this round. And then we can move to player two. We can see that, um, how about A? A is no longer a best response to anything. B is, so is D. Uh, now we have to check whether it is dominated. It is dominated by B, and E is also going to be dominated by B. So now we only have two columns left for the column player. We go back to the row player, and we can see that um, we can see that now B is not going to have a response to anything, and it's actually going to be dominated by um, by W. W is have a response to something. X is not dominated by W, and it's not dominated by Y. So at this point, there are no more dominated. Um, actions for the row player. We can check that there are also no dominated actions for the column player and therefore we are finished doing iterated dominance. Since the only action that was dominated on the first round was um, action D which was dominated by A, then the, the, that's the answer to part A. For part B, we can go back to our table and see which actions are not, which actions survived till the very end, the ones that we didn't cross out, and those actions are going to be W, X, and Y for player one, and B and D for player two. For part C, I'm going to go a little bit slower because we haven't done this with a table before. We need to check every outcome, um, which is every box in this table, whether it's dominated by something else. We see that 8 1 is not dominated by anything because 8 is the greatest payoff, but 0 1 is dominated, for example, so WA is dominated by BA because 0 is less than 8 and 1 is not greater than 1. Likewise, 0 3 is, is dominated by 5 4, 0 2 is dominated by 5 4, which are the payoffs from C and A, so we can cross them out. Uh, 2 3, 3 3 are all dominated by 5 4. 0 5 will not be dominated by anything because 5 is the highest possible payoff for player 2. Um, 5 3 is dominated by 5 4, 1 0 by 5 4, and so on and so forth. So we have to check each table and compare to each every other table in the box and see whether it, there is a table where both numbers are weakly greater and at least one of the two numbers are, is strictly greater. So the way to answer this question was to go back to the definition of, of Pareto efficiency which, I ha as I have mentioned before, it's, it's one of the most standard and important definitions that we use all the time in economics. So it's very important that you remember this moving forward to other classes. So we see that only four boxes survived, and that those are going to be the boxes that correspond to the four undominated outcomes, which are going to be AB, XB, ZA, and YB. Okay, so we can go back now and write our final answer on the exam. So that's it. Um, so that's it. Um, it wasn't an exam with lots of computations, but it was conceptually challenging. Uh, if you have any questions, send me an email or post it in the forums.